Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Middle Ground Book Fest panel on disability in middle grade. I am so excited to be here. This is one of my favorite topics to discuss. Um, and I'm particularly excited to get to discuss it today with this incredible panel of disabled authors and um, educators who are going to be able to approach this from so many different uh, experiences of disability. And I think we're going to have a really great conversation today. So I let's go ahead and start by each of us going around and introducing ourselves and our books. And then we'll go ahead and jump into questions. So um, I am Cindy Baldwin, and I am a middle grade author. My books are called Where the Watermelons Grow, Beginners Welcome, and The Stars of Whistling Ridge that just came out um, a couple weeks ago. And I am disabled and really passionate about the importance of accurate and authentic disability representation, particularly in kidlet, and particularly in this middle grade space where so many kids are developing their really formative ideas of the world. So I can't wait to talk about this with all of you. Yay, hi, thank you guys for coming. I'm Sarah Allen. I am the author of What Stars Are Made Of and Breeding Underwater. This came out last year, this one came out in March. Um, what Stars Are Made Of is about a young girl born with a, gen a genetic disorder called Turner Syndrome. And um, this uh, Breathing Underwater is about uh, a girl, a sibling story about a sisterhood who had a sister who has depression is struggling with mental illness. Um, so I also am so excited to be here and talk about the ways that disability representation matters so much in this, both in the sense of um, seeing of, of kids seeing themselves represented but then also kind of universalizing it that that really so many of these experiences are uh able to be understood and relatable to so many people so i'm so excited to talk about that hey everybody i'm nesh shortly i am a middle school librarian i work in um, pittsburgh north carolina and i'm really excited to be here as well i I'm always looking for really good books about disability to put in a library and to recommend to the other librarians in my district. Um, our kids are hurting for these books, both the disabled kids who need to see themselves and the non-disabled kids who really need to see um, more positive and less inspirational take on disability. Um, so I'm really excited to be here and talk to all of y'all about that. Okay, the order changed. So I, I know. <laughs> okay. I'm Anna Riazzi. I'm the middle grade author of The Gauntlet and The Battle, both of which are out from Simon & Schuster Salam Reads imprint and the forthcoming A Bit of Earth, which is coming out from Green Willow Books in 2022. Um, I'm very honored and excited to be here, particularly since I feel like disability is something that I've talked about more on the Y side of things. I participated in the Y anthology Unbroken, um, and it's, it's just something that I haven't really talked about as openly as some of my other marginalizations. So very honored to have been invited, very honored to participate among all these other greats who are here. Uh, hi, um, my name is Mike Chung, and I'm, I'm next, even though it doesn't visually look like that, right? Um, I, I'm a middle grade author. I've written three books. Uh, first was called Geeks, Girls, and Secret Identities. I have them all here because I'm immensely prepared. My second is called Ident Unidentified Suburban Object, and my most recent is The Boys in the Back Row, which just came out uh, in October of last year. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, I'm autistic. Uh, it, it's it's something I learned about myself pretty late in life. In fact, after I had actually done most of the work of writing these three novels. So um, so my, my books, my novels so far, don't actually feature on the page disabled characters. Although as, as I've been more outspoken and, and have become more educated, I've been trying to engage in public dialogue about disability rights and about autistic rights. Um, I have had more and more people coming to me and say that um, my uh, my characters are clearly coded as autistic, which is very interesting. Um, I do think there's a big difference between uh, 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 that coming across on a you know in, in a subtextual kind of way and, and it being explicit on the page. I do believe it is uh, tremendously important to actually put it right there clearly on the page. Um, and I've started doing that. I've written a couple of short pieces, um, including a short story about um, an autistic uh, Aikido student in a, in the We Need Diverse Books anthology. Um, uh, the hero next door. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of that. And I am very happy to be here talking with this illustrious group of people, no matter how confusing the order in which we're speaking is. 
And I think I'm left. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Will. I'm thrilled to be here. I write middle grade science fiction and fantasy, um, like Goblin Secrets and Ambassador and a Properly Unhaunted Place. Um, I can't write realism. I don't, it doesn't, it never goes show up. Um, so, and I, um, like a couple of my esteemed colleagues have just said, um, I haven't written a whole lot about disability explicitly. That's something I'm only just starting to do. Um, I did it a fair bit by metaphor for a while. Um, and then one of the first, and I've been doing it through short stories lately. Um, the, the, the House on the Moon, I think, was the first short story that I wrote that was explicitly about disability from a middle grade perspective. So, so I'm fairly new to putting it clearly on the page as opposed to sneaking up on the topic um, in a sideways sort of way. And, um, and this is really important to me because I walk with a cane and that's usually a sign of villainy in a character, which can be cool. I mean, I love a good cane sword. Um, and, because idealized normativity is really boring and dangerous, and because anyone can become disabled or find out that they have always been disabled at any time. And if we don't have stories for that, if we don't have some kind of story-shaped framework for that experience, then when it happens, we are off book and lost. And I'd rather have some kind of guide. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I love everything that you've said. Um, I will. I could not agree with you more about needing to have some kind of guide. That's something that that I think a lot about in my writing because I was born with a genetic condition, but it started really manifesting and getting more serious when I was in middle school, and mm -hmm. that's exactly how I felt. I felt like I had no guide for the experiences that I was having, and like all of my beloved book characters were in completely other worlds from what I was experiencing. And so that's something I think a lot about as an author is reaching those kids who are experiencing things and feeling so alone in that. And, and adults, I think as well, since a lot of us, you know, grapple differently or learn about disabilities as we get older. Um, I also, I loved that uh, on that note that several people kind of answered a, a, a you know, spoke to the fact that um, many of us are, are established authors who are only beginning now to explore disability in our writing. And that has definitely been true for me. Um, my earlier books touch on different parts of the disability experience, but none of them are really um, super close to my personal experiences. It's definitely taken me several books to get to the point where I was ready to look at things more head on. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing that several people brought up. Um, so the first thing that I kind of wanted to ask and, and discuss with you guys is that for a lot of history, the stories of disabled people have been told both in fiction and in nonfiction media representations by abled people. And how do you think that disability stories are different when they are told by disabled people being rather than being told by abled people who do not have experience with disability. Okay, that is that is like such a an awesome question to start with and it's a it's a pretty um I think it's a deceptively simple question too that uh, that you actually have like the more you dig into it the more things you find. Um and just to touch on the fact too I was noticing as well that so many of us talked about how we're just now feeling comfortable or feeling ready to write about these experiences. And I know, so What Stars Are Made Of is my debut, um, but I wrote several books before that. And when I finally decided to write about my disability and the genetic disorder I was born with, that's when I felt like my writing actually became mine in so many ways. Um, I, think, I think one of the key differences is that we're not, we're able to see our disabilities and our experiences in, in a sort of rounded, nuanced, complex way, um, just by the virtue of, uh, of it being in our own mind. And that's the case with anyone, really. You can't see anybody else's experience as nuanced and as complexly as you see your own, just that's, you know, because we're all in our own minds. And so there are those complexities and those layers that we see from inside the experience that I don't think it's possible for anyone outside the experience to see. Um, and that doesn't mean that 
it's not appropriate, uh, in my opinion, or, or not okay for abled writers to write story or write characters with disabilities. Um, but it is it is seeing it from two very different angles. Um, and I so to me, it comes down to those layers and that nuance that that we're not that we're seeing this rounded thing in ourselves. We're seeing a uh, a round layered existence, um, and we're able to bring that and flesh out that experience um, where where someone who's not inside the experience would not maybe be able to do that as well. <laughs> yeah, that was a great answer. Um, I, I agree completely, and I also think that, um, honestly, a lot of non-disabled people don't spend a lot of time thinking about what it's like to be disabled. <laughs> um, and the, the uh, thinking about like the most famous books about with disabled characters or the most famous movies or TV shows and things like that with disabled characters, they're all so tropey and so far removed from um, well, my own experience as a disabled person that it, it just reads as completely wrong. And I think there is so much that um, disabled authors can bring to the table about our own experiences that um, non-disabled people without a lot of introspection and a lot of learning and a lot of humbling themselves um, and a lot of honestly unlearning the ableist behaviors and, and thoughts that we all have because it's just in the society like it's baked into the society that we have if you even just think about the metaphors that we use like uh, I just had to have a conversation with my seventh graders the other day about like why we should use the R word to describe people or like why we shouldn't use lame as, as an insult like what does that tell us about what you think about maybe people who use a cane and things like that. So I think um, in general, disabled people have thought about these things more um, and so we can bring a more nuanced perspective to writing up disabled characters. Yeah, I think um, Sarah and Ness just really gave like brilliant answers and I'm gonna piggyback a little bit. Um, just speaking from a personal perspective, um, like, like Mike, I came to like, my neurodivergent um, diagnosis, like kind of, well, not late. I mean, I'm still in my twenties, but you know, kind of later than some other people who have like, you know, been able to recognize it for years. Like, you know, for years I was telling myself, oh, like, you know, you're imagining this or, oh, you know, like in this, this book, they showed it this way. So like, you know, you don't feel that way. So it's probably not that. And um, I think that's a harmful, like, you know, thing that's out there for young readers that if you're looking for some validation for yourself some sort of like is someone else feeling this and then you see like you know in terms of usual um usually able people writing works about disabled people it's like like intense tragedy intense struggle nothing good ever happens the like like you know the most horrible like symptoms not like you know really paying attention to how the person is dealing with it but how it's affecting the able people around them there's not a lot of like inner searching inner like you know or even like an inner sense of peace like um you know i was talking to some friends and they were like you know well how do you feel about this and it's just like n like you know a few of the able people seem really like shocked that it was just like you know i honestly have a sense of peace you know and relief and validation that someone looked at me and said this you know like what you are experiencing is normal it's your normal um, you know, hearing those words were so important for me to be able to hear that, um, that, you know, like, I, I feel like that's really one of the important things, like Sarah said about these layers, like when you are living the experience, you can like, you know, really wholeheartedly give those layers. And you can also understand that, you know, even stories where, you know, they, they might say like, oh, like, you know, it doesn't matter because it's an adventure story. Well, how will like, for instance, a neurodivergent kid um like you know approach this adventure what kind of internal feelings are they having like you know what kind of um you know stems are they doing to like comfort themselves in the middle of a crisis like you know what what are they feeling like there are so many parts of the experience that can be authentically shared by an author who knows that nuanced experience or like you know their particular experience and other people with that particular experience because you know it's not a monolith not everybody is you know experiencing it the same way but it does feel like there's like this authenticity that readers need to see in order to know like oh yes like this is me like this is my community, I belong here, um, you know, rather than like reading a portrayal and then going, hmm, or like even reading the portrayal that's so far off that it's just like, 
what is this, like what's happening here you know um so that's kind of my feeling on you know why it's so important for this to be like uh you know stories to come from disabled voices oh it's my turn um i'm gonna go uh I'm trying very hard not to repeat things that um, people are saying because people are saying such great things. Um, I mean, I, I, I was lucky, I think, in my journey um, uh, to understanding, you know, who I am in full when I was diagnosed, but like five years ago. Um, and in terms of how that works in children's literature, because um, I, I already had friends, autistic friends, both inside and outside of children's publishing who, um, who I'd been talking with and who I um, who were very supportive and 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 were very helpful in in, in terms of um, you know educating myself and so um, I did when I when I did fully realize and understand that I'm autistic it was a very celebratory moment for me like Karina Karina was saying it's like there was this immense relief right like this idea that like oh there was actually nothing wrong with me no matter what other people might think no matter what the whole of American society might think um, there's nothing wrong with me this is actually just uh, part of who I am an important part and an all-encompassing part um, so it was very like very empowering um, and the way that I perceive well whether I think now about um, you know stories about specifically about autistic characters but also disabled characters at large um, being written by people who actually share that disability or, or don't, um, is that there is a huge difference between um, writing about uh, living a life as a disabled person um, that comes from your external and internal experiences um, and, and writing a book about a character that's based entirely on perception. Um, because I think that whether you're the parent of an autistic child, whether you are someone who um, is like has worked professionally with with autistic adults or autistic children, whether you just like have friends, um, it's it's not impossible to write um, a really good, true, um, authentic to the experience book um, from that perspective. But it is a thousand times more difficult because it is perception. No matter how much research that a person does, no matter how many people that they talk to, no matter how you know involved they may get in the in the disabled community um, at hand that they are writing about, um, everything they write is going to be based on how they perceive the experience of, for example, being autistic. Um, and that layer, that filter, is just going to be there no matter what. Even if they are, if a person is really well informed. Um, about what kind of you know anecdotal experiences autistic people talk about, it is still filtered through their perception. It is still how they perceive and understand it. Um, and what too often happens is that those perceptions give you know disproportionate weight to certain aspects of what it means to be disabled. So you will have books about um, disabled characters, um, neurodivergent characters that um, uh, place too much emphasis on a clinical viewpoint. Right. Or they'll place too much emphasis on um, what it means to be a family member of that person or um, or the appearance of that person. There's all these different ways in which um, authors who do not share the disability of the character that they're writing about can focus too much on the things that are that don't merit the most focus. Um, and so uh, so that is, I think, um, one of the ways in which I've been thinking about this lately. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Alexander. Thank you, Mike. What's left to say? Um, <laughs> um, yes, all of that a thousand times. Um, and I find, to build on that further, there can be a touch of, I mean, this is, this is a strong way to put it, but um, from, from outside, a disability narrative can, can show up on the page with a touch of the sideshow carnival. Um, uh, even apologies for the term, but it gets at what I, what I want to get at more directly than anything else I can think of. Um, a bit of the freak show, um, to imagining disability from the outside. There's some spectacle to it. There's some voyeurism and a kind of a cheap thrill and, a, oh, wouldn't that be horrible? And it, yeah, no, not really, not always. Um, thank you kindly. Um, I mean... Again, as has been said, we're not a monolith, and 
in being in community doesn't make anyone immune to criticism or disagreement and no community I've ever been a part of has universally agreed on anything ever. Um, but from the outside, um, especially Mike, what you were just saying about, about focusing on the wrong things and they might not be untrue, but they're the wrong things to emphasize. Um, I remember a presentation I saw by a graduate student um, um, writing about a topic very close to this um, and about disability representation. And during that lecture, uh, she showed a clip that was an interview with um, an athlete, a mountain climber who had been injured on the side of a mountain and um, I think in a rock slide and survived, but she lost her hand. And the way she's telling that story, she is so happy She's like, I almost died and I didn't. And that was badass. Look at me being alive. You know, the mountain didn't kill me. This is great. And everyone, and she talked with like joy and smiling. She talked about talking to her friends, talking to her family members, and everyone was so tragic and whispering. And are you okay? This is, I can't imagine if that had happened to me. This is, this is a horrible, irrevocable thing. She's like, yeah, you, no, that, that would be death which didn't happen. Um, and so the contrast between her sense of celebration um, and excitement and just learning what's really cool about a prosthetic hand uh, versus the, the tragedy that everyone around her infused um, her story with, um, that's always struck me, just that smile and that joy and that, hey, I'm not dead, it's great. Oh my gosh, I you, all of those answers are amazing. I feel like we could just sit in a room and talk about this for hours and hours. Uh, I could not agree more with everything that you've said. I think it is such a different perspective. And I think the thing is that, that um, kind of like Mike said, no matter you know how much research an abled author does, you can tell in reading that. And I, I used to do, um, when the website Disability and Kidlet was active, I did a couple of book reviews for them for books that were about cystic fibrosis, which is one of my conditions. And I learned through reading those and doing those reviews that I could tell before I ever got to the acknowledgements of a book, if an author had talked to people with cystic fibrosis while writing it, or if they had only talked to parents of children with cystic fibrosis but while writing it, because like, and obviously, I have I was raised by really wonderful parents who don't have CF but the parent experience of my disease is worlds different than the the experience of the disabled person and that comes through no matter how much additional research an author does because the entire viewpoint and the entire world perspective is just really different and and it kind of got to be like a game where i <laughs> i would tell my husband i'll be like oh this one they did not talk to an adult with cystic fibrosis writing this book because you can tell that the whole world view is very based on the idea of a parent raising a, a child with this serious terminal disease um anyway so thank you for those responses those are wonderful so another thing that I wanted to talk about is I kind of over the last couple of years have in trying to figure out why so many books about disability that have problematic representation are published and upheld by a lot of gatekeepers in the community. Um, I've kind of come to develop this theory that I think that a lot of it is because many readers just truly don't understand what good disability representation is and what it is not. Um, because we have all grown up kind of like steeped in the culture of ableism that has you know, taught all of us, disabled or non-disabled, to, to view disability narratives in one specific way. And so it's hard to recognize when that way is false because it's all we've ever seen. So I wondered if there are, for each of you, are there any particular tropes or stereotypes that you see in media representations of disabled people that you feel are harmful? Um, Will kind of got a head start on this when he mentioned the, the villain with the cane, which that's such a great example. But I, I was curious, what other things you have encountered that you would like to point out, like, yes, that is not good disability representation? So, uh, excuse me, so this is a really interesting one for me because the only times I had ever seen Turner syndrome represented, and it's a very, you know, a lot of these disabilities can be very, like I've been to doctors that don't even know what Turner syndrome is. So they can be very like, 
out of the out of the common knowledge. Um, the two times I had ever seen it represented were in a book called The Condition, um, which I have not read, so I can't actually speak to the writing. Um, and then the other one was in an episode of like one of those crime shows like SVU or something. And the victim uh, was a girl with Turner syndrome and she had been kidnapped. And the detectives reasoned that the kidnapper had to be a pedophile because if you have Turner syndrome, you are trapped in the body of a child. <laughs> And I was like, wow. So, you know, step one, uh, do any research at all <laughs> and you'll be ahead of ahead of a lot. Um, and so, I, I mean, just this idea of the of the disabled character being a plot device for the abled story. Um, and maybe, you know, because the thing is, like if you maybe you do have side characters that are disabled, maybe you're not centering it on on a disabled story or a disabled character. And that's that's totally fine. Um, but just basically remembering that everybody is complex and nuanced um, and nobody wants to be treated. You know, we talk in writing all the time about how every side character or every character is the protagonist of their own story. And just remembering that that includes disabled characters as well and that they're interacting with their experience in an individual character nuanced way, just like any other character, and that they aren't just there as a plot device for the abled story. Um, so that, to me, that would be a good place to start in terms of avoiding, you know, we have like the sexy lamp test for female characters, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe we need something like that. Like if your disabled character can be replaced by a disabled lamp, I don't know, <laughs> then you're not maybe doing it as well as you could be. Um, so that would be my, my starting point. A lamp with a tragically ripped shade. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, that one is also one of my least favorite. I did my um, master's research on this exact topic, basically. And one of the books that I read, uh, there was one main disabled character in it, and he was killed off page in order to spur the protagonist on to go live her life and, and do an adventure. And it was just... Oh, I hate that so much. But um, I guess the other one that I there's so many that I that I hate, but one that I see a lot, especially in middle grade, is um, like the disabled character is only their disability. Like there's nothing else to them, and the non-disabled characters in the story like applaud them for doing very basic things that all of us, I mean, that that people can do, and that and that just I really hate the inspiration trope where we're at the end of a book say that a, a, a child gets an award just for showing up to school every day and continuing to show up to school every day as a disabled kid. Um, I really hate that so much. And I think that's such a super harmful trope for and really paternalistic and condescending um, in a way that, that certainly um, as a school librarian that interacts with a lot of disabled kids um, and also special educators who are the ones responsible for educating those kids. Um, you can see the impact that that has of treating kids um, as if every single thing they do is inspirational just because they are disabled, just because they're autistic or whatever disability they have. They have CF or they have cerebral palsy or anything like that. Um, I think the tropes that like, fuel ableism in, in people in the real world are the most, the ones that I see as some of the most harmful. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure, I feel like in my first two books, I was very much like writing from a perspective on one disability for a minor character that now I understand and recognize better. And I look back at those books and I'm just like, mm, should have done better on those ones. But I think the good thing to move forward with is the acknowledgement that I understand it better. And, um, you know, it's, it's something where getting like um like sarah said and cindy said reading a book um you know and you can tell if you spoke to people about it um like you know reading into that book and like you know saying okay well even if this is something i experience externally like you know what is it internally and so that's something that i've been like you know looking at myself in terms of my writing like you know disabilities moving forward like you know what is it that not only even as someone experiencing it am i writing in a way that i kind of perceive that um 
that the non-disabled gaze is going to be comfy with. Because I think a lot of these stories that get upheld is like, like, um, like Will just said, like the freaks show sort of like, ooh, like this is what we expect. You all are struggling. You all are like tormented. You all are not at peace at all. You're kind of like just, you know, living and waiting for the scraps of praise, like in like, you know, those sort of like inspiration stories. You're such an inspiration to all of us to like, you know, live every day like we're dying, you know, like all that usual like nonsense. Um, and um, that's something I see a lot in those stories. I really like nowadays, especially I'm really attuned to like, oh my gosh, like, I do not like this at all. It feels like, you know, the character is not being respected. I'm not going to name the title, but as a former seventh grade English teacher, my kids once um, begged me to show them a movie based on a book that's not by an able author. I'm not going to say which one because there are several, so I'm innocent. And I spent the whole time just trying to just go like, guys i've read this book this movie is just really just taking a turn for the worse the more we go like let's have a discussion about this afterwards and you know at first they were kind of just like you're harshing our vibe here what's going on like you know you can't just like be quiet and let us watch the movie because every five seconds i'm like kids that is not how it works i hate the fact that they're doing this to this kid oh my gosh like what is happening here why are they like treating this kid like a spectacle and you know um I hope they came away with it, not just saying, oh, like, you know, she's a real buzzkill to watch a movie with, but just like, I really just like, you know, physically couldn't take it. Like, you know, I guess if I was at their age, I would have still been at the point where it's just like, oh, like, you know, this is so inspirational. I don't know anybody with this syndrome, but like, you know, I had gotten older and I was just like, I was thinking of all my like disabled friends were just like, you know, pointing out every single thing happening in the book alone. And then the movie took it like, you know, several different levels up. Um, you know, and I was just like, I can't, you know, not say anything anymore. Um, it's been interesting for me specifically recently because I'm retelling a classic, The Secret Garden, where ableism, not only ableism, but ableism linked to racism is such an entrenched thing in that book. It's like, in India, you suffer. Come to England, you will heal and be healed. And that's something I've been really like just grappling with recently, where it's just like, okay, not only is there ableism, but it's ableism that also kind of comes into play with um, like, you know, being disabled is something um that, you know, is is for lesser brown folk. Like, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't be experiencing this. Come to like, you know, your homeland and be healed and not, you know, have these problematic sort of neurodivergent um, you know, habits anymore and you know, also heal your your cousin who is bedridden. You know, like it's 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 just it's a mess. And um, you know, I'm grateful in a way that I'm getting this opportunity to kind of like, you know, unearth what my problems were reading it as a kid. Um but those are just things I've been thinking of recently. Like, you know, what really bothers me when it, like, you know, um, it comes to one of these books. And a lot of times it's really just what everybody else already said. It's just like, it's not really about that character about, or about their experience at all. It's about how other people are consuming them, not only the viewers and the readers, but the people around them. And it's about other problematic, like sort of tropes about like, you know, who is disabled, who's not, whether it's um, desirable to be disabled or not. and it's just a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts too, and I'm thinking, could pick just one, Cindy, just pick one trope. Is that fair? Really? I, you might be asking too much, but um, I mean, there are so many, you know, um, one of the first that come to mind for me is always the, the idea of disabled characters just being burdens on the people around them. That plays out in so many ways. But um, to, to, to continue on with this idea of the inspirational disabled character, um, that, that drives me up the wall as well. Um, and the way that I think it plays out often is, is that the disabled character um, is inspirational sometimes, not just for being disabled, but because somehow the, the you know, horrible experience of living as a disabled person has turned them into a better human than everyone else, right? Um, because they've put up with so much and yet they're still so kind in response. They've, they were abused and they're bullied and they're terrorized, but they've risen above it and reached like a new plane of humanity that the rest of us have not. And they're, they're and now we can look up to them. Um, the way that that is destructive, I think, is first of all, it sets this bar, you know, for for disabled readers to be looking at this and thinking, "What? That's actually how I'm supposed to deal with, you know, being the person that I am. I'm supposed to like rise above it all, um, be better than everybody else." 
um, asking too much, right? And and it, um, I, I, I think, I mean, when I'm in a charitable moment, I think that authors who write um, books using that particular trope are, you know, maybe trying to um, show like, uh, how destructive and et cetera can be to be cruel and to be bullying, et cetera. But I think what actually happens is that I think there's this very sort of covert and unconscious way in which it actually gives a license to be, right? Um, there's there's a way in which I think it actually suggests the idea that, oh, well, you know, people can get over that. Like, you know, this is, this is like rank humanity and it's just the way it is and people are just gonna be like this. But really, if you're an inspirational, disabled, you know, angel character, you will rise above it. Um, uh, so it, it, I think it raises the bar <laughs> for disabled people and disabled characters and it lowers the bar for able people and able characters. Um, and, um, and it's maddening, it's maddening. And, and of course, um, those books get feted and, and recognized and canonized and, and celebrated and brought into classrooms and libraries forever. And just, yeah. Anyway, that's all. Okay, this is a fun segue. Um, so from, from canonization and, and sainthood, um, this is, uh, so a little ancestral Catholicism is rising up in the back of my brain. Um, after sainthood comes martyrdom and um, one of the most dangerous tropes that crops up in so many different ways, 100,000 different ways, uh, is that we're better off dead. The, the sacrificial sidekick who dies. I don't know if anyone's played the card game Munchkin, but I remember the superhero version of it. Like, you can level up your character by killing off a sidekick. <laughs> and then with tragic rage, you get stronger. Um, yeah, the sacrificial characters, the ones who can't get away from the zombies and fight so that the able-bodied heroes can escape and learn and change and grow. And, and, or the, the character who dies by mercy killing, which, I mean, that's, it's like the writer is unable to envision our thriving survival gives, gives us heartfelt mercy killings instead, which is, is so very nice of them, uh, except that's, I mean, literally and historically, that's a fascist narrative. That is a that is a Nazi story. They came for the disabled kids early on, and all of that was justified as an act of mercy. So, yeah, I don't like th those uh, stories, or, um, or the evil cripple stories. I mean, I love Star Wars. I adore Star Wars. But Vader, as a you're broken on the outside, therefore broken on the inside. Um, more machine now than man. I've always loved Star Wars, but particular when disability when you're not a character with a disability, but the disability itself is a metaphor. What is it a metaphor of? And in Star Wars, um, just inhumanity, straight up, explicitly, um, Obi Wan lays it out that that is what this is a symbol of in the logic of the story, um, which does not feel great. <laughs> Yeah, I could not agree more. I, because of my cystic fibrosis, I have breathing problems and I have to do breathing treatments every day. And like my entire life, the number one comment that I get is like, oh, wow, you sound exactly like Darth Vader. So, <laughs> so yeah, that, um, I, I feel like I run all the time into that idea of disability as a metaphor. And it either means you're evil or it means you're weak. And it, it crops up all the time, like in places where I'm still continually surprised. And all of those answers were so good. Um, Mike, when you were talking about the, you know, the inspirational, um, kind of like the super crip narrative, I just couldn't help thinking of how every Christmas time, I feel like I just like have this full body cringe when I'm, you know, listening to or watching A Christmas Carol and it gets to that point where Tiny Tim's like, I'm going to go to the church so that everybody can see me and be inspired. And I just feel like so much of the way that we portray disability in media has grown from that idea that like, you know, here's this dis saintly display figure that we're going to hold up so that everybody can be dis inspired before he probably dies. Um, so one last question, we've got just a couple minutes left. So, you know, one last quick question here. What is one piece of advice that you would give to abled allies in the education and, and um, library fields for 
sharing and boosting and upholding the stories of disabled people? I love this question and it gives me a chance to share one of my favorite tweets from Mary Robinette Qual. Um, and it's not even about disability, but she says, it's not about adding diversity for the sake of diversity. It's about subtracting homogeneity for the sake of realism. And that kind of is an, sort of where I would start as, as if I'm giving advice to abled writers who want to, to do this, is just to keep that in mind that, that it's, it's not about adding diversity, adding disabled characters for the sake of diversity. It's that we make up a large percentage of the population. Um, and then of course, you know, doing your research, but just adding, just remembering that, that it's just in the world building, just in the world around. I, one, of, <clears throat> one of the places I've noticed this recently is the Pixar movie Onward. Um, it's not even about, it's not a disability story, but when he's trying to make friends with the kids at school, um, one of them just, it's just how the characters are. One of them has arm canes. I think there's another character with hearing aids. Um, and of course, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you know, you're not treating any disabled characters as a plot device or, you know, you're, you're giving them as, as much of a rounded story as you would any of your characters. Um, but just remembering that we exist is a good place to start and that in the world, um, why not have the characters and, and the people that, that your protagonist is running into, you know, it, it, as part of the world, as part of the fabric of the reality, because that's, that is reality. So that's where I would start. <laughs> um, I would say to, to librarians who uh, want to have their collections reflect the fact that disabled people are at least 20% of the population, so we should have, um, you know, books that reflect our own experiences is to do the same stuff that good librarians do all the time, which is to uh, read the books, look up reviews, preferably by, you know, off, uh, reviewers that share the disabilities of the characters in the book, to Twitter is a great resource, honestly, for collection development. You can find people, you'll find people talking about whatever book that you're looking for, and it can be um, a really great place, as long as you carry your feet, to get kind of tipped off to the, the new books that are coming out that have high quality disability representation in it. Um, reach out, I mean, in, in my district, I tend to be the one that, even though, you know, I'm, I'm the disabled person, so all the other librarians come to me to ask me about all the other books, which is um, sort of problematic, but also it's fine. <laughs> but like, if you know, if you know people who are willing to help you out to say like, hey, I heard about this book, I'm not sure about, um, the quality of the representation do you either know how if it's good have you read it or do you can you point me in the direction of some other resources that i can look to um i think we librarians and educators in general need to start um it's been long past time for us to start interrogating why we are upholding harmful narratives of disability um, and to search out high quality ones both for our disabled kids who deserve as dr rudine sims bishops wrote mirrors um, of their own experiences and for non-disabled kids to get those windows into what um, various disabled experiences are like. Yeah, my advice to educators would be pretty much what Ness just said. And like, I kind of boiled it down to one sentence, who likes it? If only able people are liking a story and giving it awards. Like I know it's our instinct to say, it got an award, it's good. Like I'm gonna give it to my kids. I'm gonna like assign it, but please do your due diligence. Um, you know, that doesn't mean anything, honestly. Um, it just means that sometimes, you know, a good awards committee gets really swayed by, oh my gosh, this was so touching. And, you know, they don't consider the harm that's being done with it or the stereotypes it falls into. Um, so you should be, you know, taking that into consideration. It's never just a story. Um, it is something that the kids internalize and they take with them whether they're abled or not. Um, you know, the abled kids will internalize that this is, you know, how I should treat a disabled person or this is how I should look at a disabled person. Um, the disabled kids are not seeing themselves, you know, appropriately, and that is very important for them to be able to see themselves. So, you know, just do your due diligence. With writers, it's the same thing. Do your due diligence. Um, I used to um, moderate for an online blog where we kind of gave like, you know, general questions based on like, you know, whichever mod had the marginalization. And a lot of people would write in and want to like, you know, use 
disability or even like any marginalization as a plot point or like, you know, she here, they are doing this because of, you know, this. And I, I want to know if this is problematic. Yes, it is problematic. Um, like we said, like, you know, disability is a reality of life. It is nothing weird, wrong, or freakish. Um, like, you know, a character with a disability should, you know, be acknowledging their experience in their journey, but that doesn't mean you just like suddenly start, like, you know, tossing it in there and saying, well, like, you know, conveniently the monsters are drawn to him because like, you know, this, or like, you know, the blind character is the wise seer, like, you know, and the oracle and like, you know, has all this innate in touch thing with nature like there are like weird stereotypes around disabilities like you know like like mike said like sort of like the super crip like stereotype like you know don't fall into that either and say well i'm honoring you all because i made them really cool but i also kind of played again into like another stereotype so just really be aware and like you know also let down your defenses um i think this is something we all need to keep in mind in general as writers like you know it's easy to say well this character is close to my heart this idea is close to my heart i don't want to change it but when people from a community that you've hopefully been reaching out to with permission and you know researching from are saying well i don't think this is hitting the mark in what you meant um you should you know take a few steps back do some more research and make sure you're sending it out into the world like, you know, to perpetuate good representation and not add to the mountain of bad representation. Um, <clears throat> this is a great group of people, isn't it? Um, on, on a, I mean, on a general scale, like a lot of what people have always been saying, like, uh, you know, I, th I think it's important to educate ourselves. Um, I think that it's really important to read widely in terms of disability, like read all the books that you can find. Um, because that's uh, one of the ways in which you're going to start to understand um, what the tropes are and what the stereotypes are and like what the, you know, pervasive single stories are. Like in terms of autistic characters, the, the single story for a long time was um, the, you know, the severely autistic character who, um, who, whose ex very existence makes life um, tremendously hard for everyone around them, including their family. And, and it was just that. It was those were the only books that, that featuring autistic characters at all. Um, and I don't want to say that there's no truth in those books or that they don't necessarily have a place, but um, but they they represent still in so many ways like autism in Kidlet um, on on a on the mag, on the macro scale, um, and it's such a narrow slice really of what it means to be autistic and alive, um, and and thing that that is changing. Um, to some degree now. I mean, it, it is really heartening that we have um, many more um, autistic authors, openly autistic authors who are writing about autistic char characters. Um, uh, whether there are enough of those that are people of color, I mean, they're mostly white, so that's, all, that's a whole other thing. Um, but um, be aware of, like, be aware of the history of, of the tropes and the stereotypes and, and the pervasive narratives. Um, and, and be aware that, you know, we don't have to per perpetuate those, that there are other options and that we can continue to push and ask for other options. Okay, the one thing I wanna quickly add to all of that more impressive advice um, is I, allies, especially in education, especially in library fields, Learn the difference between medical and social models of disability. I mean, Google those things um, super fast. Um, just a really reductive way of laying it out. A medical model of disability is that this is a problem that can be fixed. There is a cure. There is a pill. You broke your leg. I can set the bow and make a cast and you'll be fine. Um, there, And sometimes that's true. Depending on what's going on, sometimes there's a fix and a cure. Um, so the medical model is not always wrong. The problem is, I mean, those of us with chronic conditions, um, we represent a failure of the medical model. Like, we can fix that. No, we can't. Okay, then our very existence becomes an embarrassment to, to medicine and to its aspirations. Um, and that sucks. The social model for disability um, is, is the, the context what surrounds it. And my favorite example of this um, was a, a blog post that I read many years ago by a blogger, no idea what their actual name is or anything about them, but, oh, we lost Mike. Hope he comes back. Um, is a blogger called Kamikaze Wheelchair, I think, um, who described the medical model uh, as, um, imagine you're on Mars, 
There's a Martian civilization, like a John Carter, Martians all have four arms. And you are fine. You are, as you are right now, living on Mars, and there is nothing wrong with you. But every door to every building on Mars requires four arms to open. So there's nothing wrong with you, but the world you're in was not made for you. And it will only reluctantly accommodate you if you point out that you can't get through any of the doors. Um, so that, that is my favorite, that blog post from many years ago that I has disappeared from the internet, I haven't been able to find it, um, is my favorite uh, science fiction illustration of the social model of disability. It's not that anything was broken, that anything is wrong with the person, but there is a context that either through oversight or through active denial, um, makes it impossible to move through that world. Mike's back. And that, and that is, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Medical social model of disability. Google that. Yeah, I that all was such phenomenal advice. And I agree, learning about the social model of disability has been really helpful to me. And I think has helped me identify things in books that are good and harmful representation. Um, thank you all of you for joining me for this. This has been such a dream conversation with a dream lineup of authors. And the things that you have had to say are so insightful. And I appreciate your time. Um, and I hope I wish the best of luck to each of you in your next projects.